Thanks so much. Uh, if you haven't picked up one of the handouts, um, each session in this room anyway, we'll have a one-page handout. It's at least a brief overview, a way for you to keep, keep track of where I'm going and uh, maybe write some notes on the back. Um, I'm thankful for your being here. Thank you so much for sharing in this session with me. The first session dealt with the centrality of the local church and missions. It was primarily biblical. So it's a, a big, take a step back. Let's think about the Bible and the Great Commission. Let's think about what God wants to do in this world, what his purposes are and his means. And now we're gonna start working on some things that are more uh, practical in nature for local church leadership, and that is leading with focus and effectiveness. I am gonna start with a little brief intro. I'm sorry for those who have already seen this before. Um, but for those who haven't, I want you to know that I'm a regular guy. Uh, I'm a church elder. I'm a missions elder at our church and have been for over 20 years. Uh, we have over 40 years of ministry and church planting in the United States on the field in mission leadership, which is not insignificant. So when I go to mission leaders um, and talk about the candidates that are coming on to them, Coming, coming on with them, that is, and with the, uh, the churches that I counsel and help and guide in what kind of church agency relationships to have, the agency leaders say, you cheat because you are one of us and you know the inside scoop of what we can do and what we can't do, and you walk around all the landmines. So I enjoy doing that. Um, by God's grace, we were able to found Propempo International so that we would have a ministry that would reproduce ourselves many times on the field, going to unreached people groups. At the time we started, um, Kathy and I were not able to go to the field because of a serious health issue, and we just felt like mobilizing the church to produce more quality missionaries to reach the last parts of the Great Commission was what we wanted to do. Um, as such, I am a missions mobilizer, a trainer, and a shepherd. And in particular, we've been concerned and interested in the Arab Muslim world and what's going on in that part of the world. I recently came back from a trip where I visited missionaries that we've helped to mentor through their sending churches out on the field. Tremendous number of stories, really good stuff, seeing how the Lord's blessing them and seeing uh, people coming to saving faith in Christ and beginning to form churches in this really hard area of the world. These next two little one-minute videos will maybe give a better explanation of the dynamic of what Propempo does. Hi, I'm David with Propempo International. Our focus is on local churches, helping local churches step up to take their role in the Great Commission seriously. We want to see really good local churches raise up workers for unreached people groups hard places in the world in the long term. So we really advocate for strong pre-field training, and we help biblically and practically with strategic things for the leaders to follow through to create those fields. So Plenipo is not a sending agency. We are educational, training, teaching, preaching kind of ministry to help local church leaders get their job done in raising up and shepherding for the field. So we're different than many other agencies out there. Every local church is unique. We consult and coach and help them uniquely for their situation and their goals, their vision. I am the pastor of our church. This is how the Tempo International helped us. We've always believed the Great Commission in Italy that how to work it out was the great mystery. We needed a guide to get us out of missions as a program to making it personal, to get skin in the game. We are so glad we found Propempo. Propempo helps local churches in missions. They help you and our leaders develop a fresh vision with biblical and practical principles. Step by step, Propempo taught us how to lead our church to be more effective and strategic in our involvement. Now our church is eager to embrace ownership of our Great Commission role and responsibilities. We have been equipped to be senders. Our church is sending out our first family. 
We have helped them to be fully qualified to go to an unreached people group that has almost no access to the gospel. The potential has been a great guide on the journey to being fully engaged in missions for God's glory. I need to get the same thing on my screen. Oh, sorry, that's my family. And here I just got myself out of the whole thing. What a handsome group. Leave it up there for a moment. Our three kids were all born in the Philippines while we were there. Um, so, you know, by popular demand here, one guy's voice in the audience. Uh, the gal on the left is our middle child, Liz. She was born in the Philippines. And then we have the the two thorns that are across both, she's the rose and the two thorns are the tall guy, um, Andrew and Nathan standing next to him. And uh, they're all believers, active in their church, married, really solid believers. They're <laughs> active in their church is a little understatement. They're super active in their churches. And each of them has three children. So much to our uh, surprise and happiness, uh, we have nine grandkids that we're praying will come to receive Christ at an early age. So there you go. Um, our purpose is to come alongside churches and develop effective biblical local church-centered missions ministry and equipping those churches to prepare, send, and shepherd workers for strategic cross-cultural church planning. And I even missed one of the churches in there, but you see how much church is in our, is in our purpose. We really believe in the local church uh, what I want to talk to you today about in this hour is using some metrics, and I'm going to use a, a tool that we call the Church Missions Profile. That's what CMP stands for, Church Missions Profile. We're going to walk through this uh, in a bit. I'm sorry I don't have printed copies. We gave up printed copies several years ago, and we have an online version that when we changed websites just a couple months ago, it stopped working. So my apologies that it's not so available but it is available online in the printed form, and you can, you can buy it there at our propempo.com shop. But uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about value principles or guiding principles, uh, and how do you define priorities and pursue focus, and then communicating vision and direction to your church. So all very practical things working out of the church's large role in missions in the local church and how that works out. So we're going to start just talking about um, church missions profile as a tool. It's not the only tool out there, but it is one that we have developed and used for, I don't know, uh, probably 10 years, and we've revised some um, since then, but you can find it at that place. It deals with 12 different categories of measurement. So one of the problems we have, two, two problems we often have with churches is really nice people like you say, um, wh why not just trust God and uh, the leading of the Spirit and just kind of go for it, just do whatever? And we're like, uh, usually, if you aim at nothing, that's what you get. Um, there is something to taking a step back and saying, how do we administer this ministry that God has given into our hands? How do we do that? And the Bible is just filled with all kinds of examples of organization and administration stuff. And the relational bods among us shudder to think, oh man, it's more administration. Well, yes and no, but it, if it's going to save you out of running off a cliff or hitting potholes and having to fix and repair stuff all the time, it's absolutely worth the investment to think about this. That's, that's number one problem is just standard aversion of really biblical truth-oriented people from doing anything that smacks of administration and organization. So sorry, um, you came to the right seminar. Second, um, one of the things that is a problem with this is how we measure ourselves, right? So 90 plus percent of the churches I go to measure themselves by what they did last year. 
Now, how accurate a benchmark is that for excellence? I would submit not very. It's not very accurate. What you want is benchmarks that represent what are the, the highest levels of faithfulness and, we'll say, performance of churches that are doing really well in the things that you want to do. So if you want to go measure yourself against somebody who's doing really well, do that. Then you have some aspirations and goals to shoot for, right? And that's what the CMP, uh, the Church Mission Profile, provides for you. It provides a benchmark based on really tens of thousands of churches that we together with our history have come in contact with that are doing really well in each of these 12 areas. Biblical foundations, local outreach, which admittedly kind of goes both ways. It's both local evangelistic outreach and maybe, depending on where you are, local outreach to internationals in your community. Missions education in the church, church leaders, missions team, individual participation, prayer, giving to missions, short-term missions, missionary care, mission strategy, and missionary training. So you guys have all of those on your handout, right? Now we're going to start expanding on that. And this is what the church missions in printed form, the CMP in printed form looks like. And I'm going to show you just basically, it's a scale. Every category has a scale going from possibility as the lowest to passion as the highest. That's just our alliterated, I'm sorry, I'm a preacher kind of thing. That's the scale. Possibility, is it a possibility? Is it a project, like a once in a while thing? Is it a program? It's a regular thing, but it's very programmatic. It's sort of automated pilot sort of thing. Is it a priority, like we're putting an emphasis there? This is a significant part. Is it a purpose, like we see this as one of the key purposes of our church? Or is it a passion, like we love this, we're all over it, everybody in the church knows it? So that's the scale. You're going to rate yourself based from lowest to highest on this. And every one of those cells, which can I do this? I think I can if I figure out it. Nope, I'm not going to do that. Oh, I can. Look here. Ta-da. Technology at its best. So every one of these cells has a little descriptor in it that helps identify. And if you were taking this in the print form, you would say, does my church do this possibility under individual participation? Does it, does it meet that descriptor? And you check it, and then you go up to the next one. Does it meet that one? Yes, 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 no. Okay, stop. Then go to the next one is prayer column and start working through that one. And when you finish, you're going to end up with something that looks like a zigzag, right? From this one, this one's high, this one's low. This one's mid, this one's low. This one's high, this one's low. Like that. And then you do what consultants call the gap analysis. What does it take to get from where we are to where we want to be in those things? The online version, you can pray that it gets healed by some techno guy's midnight oil. Um, so because the, the, the one online actually tells you what the next steps are, which is very cool that says if you're here, you're a level four on priority under individual participation. It says if you're a level four and you want to get to the next level, here's five things you could do. Take your pick. And it gives you very specific resources like books or videos or whatever to be able to do it. Has anybody in the room done the online version? Nobody. Has anybody even seen this before? One. Thanks, Kevin. You're my best friend for life. That's why you're here. Yeah. Well, I sincerely apologize for not having like printed versions out for everybody, but I'm telling you, you can go get it and print it off for yourself. It's because of how tight that text is, it's made to be printed on, on full tabloid size, 11 by 17 size paper. You can take this to your, even if you print it on 8.5 by 11 letter size, you can take it to your leadership and say, hey, take 20 minutes and fill this thing out, and then compile them and average them, right? So Kevin is the new missions leader at his church, New Community Church in St. Louis, Missouri area. And I know for a fact, this is statistically true, Kevin is going to rate everything higher than everybody else because that's his role and his responsibility. It's called the halo effect. You always rate things a little higher. But when somebody more objective and not as close to the knitting as you are evaluates it, they may come out a little bit lower. And the true answer is probably somewhere in between. So it's helpful to take several people, go through this thing, and average it out. And if you find wide disparity, like Kevin says, oh, 
missions team leadership is the best in the world, and somebody else says, uh-uh, it's the, like the worst, it's the possibility, <laughs> then you've got room for discussion. Okay? So you follow? And, and here again are those 12 categories, and, and they're just each one in a column, and there it is, all these things. You have that in your list. We're going to kind of walk through this. Let me see where I am on my slides. Yeah, we're going to start walking through this. So what do I mean by biblical foundations? I mean, how is missions taught in your church biblically? Does it show up in your pastor's messages with some frequency? And I don't mean just when he's preaching on Jonah or Matthew 28. I mean, it's woven into the biblical text. So here's the backstory on John Piper's Let the Nations Be Glad, right? That was quoted this morning by um, Mark Tatlock. Thank you. And, and Mark quoted this thing from the beginning. Well, you need to know the backstory, which is also on our website if you want further proof. It's printed on, on the internet, so it's true. <laughs> so the missions pastor at Bethlehem Baptist, they, they annually have an eight-day missions conference from Sunday to Sunday through eight days. They usually plan their speakers a couple years in advance. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for the church to have this eight-day missions conference. They've been involved in missions a lot for decades and decades and decades. And Piper is the relatively new pastor here. And he very astutely, as some pastors do, decided to always take his vacation on missions week. <laughs> so the missions pastor comes into his office like weeks before missions week and he says, John, I've got really bad news. Our speaker at the last minute had to bail out because of some personal issue. Therefore, you have to be the speaker for eight nights in a row, including like probably Sunday mornings. So that's, count them up, 10 messages. And John says, in perfect um, Minneapolis English, no way, Jose. I, I can't do that. We've already booked our family vacation. Like, you know, we could lose our deposit or something. I, I'm not going to, that's not, I don't do missions. That's you guys. You guys do that. I'll just kind of go away on vacation and pray for you. Um, in the end, the missions pastor prevailed. And John said, okay, I'll do it. So he, the guy gets dismissed. John calls out from his office to his assistant's office outside the door and says, Cancel all appointments. I'm going to lock the door and study for a missions conference. What came out of it was let the nations be glad. John had never before really studied the scripture to see missions in it at all. Even though he was a well-known Bible expositor pastor. And now he sees it all over the place. And he takes it from the Psalms and other places that God intends that the nations be glad. And it fits perfectly with his personal message of his life. That the Christian's whole joy is to be totally satisfied in God. Then that became the basis of the book. The book gets published. I went back and I said, I wonder how many times the nations are mentioned in the Old Testament apart from specific judgment on nations, right? So there, there are plenty of judgment kind of passages around, but most of the time, I, I happen to be reading in Ezekiel right now, and Ezekiel's common phrase, I think it's something like 40 times, he says that they will know that I am the Lord. That's a mission statement. So I'm going to do this thing that they will know that I'm the Lord. So Anything that has to do with all the nations or all peoples, plural in English, um, all, the, all the ends of the earth, all of those kind of phrases, I looked it up. There's over a thousand in the Old Testament mentions where God is concerned that those people know that there's one true God. It's Yahweh. Why don't we see that? We see it in a few smatterings of Psalms. We see it in, in the Abrahamic Covenant, Genesis 12, that happens to be repeated four other times, by the way. So it's no small potatoes. It's, it's a big deal to God. 
And then woven all through the prophets, it's, it's all in there. It's not just Jonah, who was a pretty sorry excuse for a missionary anyway. <laughs> Biblical foundations. Does it show up in your Bible teaching, in your adult Sunday school classes, in your Sunday morning worship time? Does it show up? Biblical foundations, really important. And that's what we start with. Local outreach. I already told you there's this dichotomy thing of, yeah, you need to be active about local evangelism. That is important. Absolutely. Equip your people. Inspire your people. Give them opportunities. Most people aren't creative enough to come up with stuff on their own about how to share the gospel. So pair them up with people who don't have that problem. Find ways or opportunities, create opportunities for them to be active in evangelism and break through that barrier of, I'm not sure, I'm a little afraid or a little reluctant. Just have them help break through that barrier. You can do that local outreach. But local outreach in these days also applies to the nations. In east side of Atlanta, I live in the southwest side of Atlanta, east side of Atlanta, there is a one square mile city called Clarkston that is the most densely multi-ethnic of any place in the United States. Why? Because it is the landing place for refugees, immigrants, from refugee camps around the world. And most of those people are Hindu and Muslim. It doesn't take much to go have a shawarma and meet somebody. What are you doing with the local people? Um, in one of the churches I was just at in Clearwater, Florida, they have a huge population of Greeks. Go have a euro. Meet some Greeks. Study your Greek. I don't know. Do something. Greek. Just, they came because at the beginning, early stages of history of the U.S., that was the place where they could go sponge harvesting in the Gulf that matched up with their family traditional jobs back in Greece before they immigrated. So they hang out together. And you see these incredible Greek Orthodox-like churches on corners, and you go, did I just drive into another country? Uh, basically, yeah. But they're there if you're looking for it. Local outreach. Missions education. Missions education starts at the earliest ages. I mean, I, I'm for having toddlers play with globes. You know, just get them started way early. Um, young ones love biographies. They love stories of children of other ethnicities and cultures from different parts of the world. They're getting to know people in their neighborhoods. Uh, there's, there's hardly a neighborhood around. You think Atlanta is deep south? We're a multi-ethnic neighborhood where we live. It's, it, you can't walk around the block without seeing people from about five different countries that are now your neighbors. That's amazing. But missions education and how to think about those things and how to reach out to people, this statistic blows my mind. So we have a lot of Hispanics that live in our part of the world, and I don't know about you guys, but you know, the stereotypical Hispanic job is construction or landscaping or you know, those kinds of things, right? Those guys live in really tough conditions. And I heard this stat, I, I believe it's true, 90% of Latinos never cross the threshold of a gringo house unless it's to service them for carpentry or something like that. Shame on us. Shame on us. I make it my point to ask people that you know, seem a little bit different than me, which is probably everybody on the planet, but ask them, where are you from? And welcome to America. I remember talking to a Walmart cashier, and this gal was obviously from some East Asia country. And I said, where are you from? She told me, I don't remember at the moment, sorry. And I said, how long have you been here? 17 years. I said, welcome to America. I know it's late. She said, you're the first one that's ever said that to me. Shame on us. Church leaders, are your church leaders clued in? Um, we just made a decision this last year, shame on us, we've been involved in missions all this time. Every one of our elders needs to visit the mission field. They need to see it for themselves. They need to taste it, smell it, touch it, lose sleep over it, whatever, you know, all the stuff that goes with that. They, they need to know what life is like. And I always say, which I may say later in this session, I don't remember where it is, don't send them on a limelight tour. 
Don't send them to be the preacher, teacher, Bible study leader. Don't do that. Send them to be the shadow of the missionary. Ask questions. What is their life really like? What are the stressors? What is their marriage really like? And then ask the wife and find out the truth. Church leaders need to be involved and own it and, and understand it. What about your missions team? I say this term, missions team, I prefer it, um, but missions committee is a very common term. You may have some other functionary title in your church, missions board or whatever, but the missions team needs to function like a team, and they need to understand, which we'll get to later, that their job is not to do missions on behalf of the church. Their job is to involve the whole church in getting involved in missions. Individual participation, we're going to talk about this in more detail, but individual participation, just how does the individual get involved in missions? Through learning, through prayer, through giving, through other means. Prayer stands on its own, we know that. Uh, prayer is sort of the basic underpinnings of every ministry in the church. It's how God works. God has ordained prayer to be an instrumental means of how he gets his will done on earth. We need to be about prayer. It needs to show up in our church meetings, in our pastoral prayers on Sunday, in our Midweek meetings, if we have them, Sunday evenings in our small groups, we need to have prayer that is aimed toward missions and educating even in the doing. Short-term missions. I really am a believer in short-term missions, but not short-term missions for the sake of short-term missions. It needs to be crafted appropriately to meet the goals of the church, and it needs to be a win-win-win situation. That's a whole other topic, but it needs to be win-win-win. It needs to be a win for the participants you will never have participants more eager to undergo whatever rigors of discipleship you put before them as people that have signed up to go to a short-term missions trip. So absolutely, unashamedly take advantage of that and work them to death. Make them real disciples. So when they leave, they understand servanthood. They understand how to submit to authority. They understand how to work without complaint. They understand to work in... In, in adverse situations and conditions, that the world does not revolve around them. A whole new idea. That's just the first win. Missionary care, we'll go over the rest. <laughs> Missionary care, this is so important. Missionary care is a, is a big deal among mission agencies today, but they still don't know how to do it because they're not a local church. Missionary care falls at the feet of the local church. I've seen so many situations, and I've, and I've participated in this as a mission director, where the mission had to say, missionary, you are in sin, you are not repentant, you are, you are fired, basically, from the mission. Who picks up the pieces? The sending church. So I have a guy to this day who says, we never had a mission agency ask the sending church to be a part of the discipline process like you did. That's, that's what it's about. We worked hand in hand with the local church to do the confronting and the accountability and then the repentance to restoration part. It's amazing. It's actually biblical and it works. Missionary care and accountability, I don't mean just the negative side of it, but the positive side. I just visited with some dear friends in Morocco. They have a, a supporting church that knows them really well and knows that they have two type A personalities married to each other on their team. And so they check up with them on Skype every month. How's it going? When was the last blowout you had? <laughs> what did that look like? Have you repented yet? <laughs> and then they come out to the field once a year and pay for a little two or three day weekend retreat with that team focusing on that particular couple with marriage building stuff. Is that awesome or what? If that church didn't do that, those guys would be home already. But they're there and they're actually being faithful and fruitful and they understand they have issues that they constantly have to work on. If it started 20 years ago, it's not going to be fixed overnight, right? So missionary care, you guys, I, I just think of so many issues of missionary care, and I almost want to cry right in front of you, because churches, sending churches particularly, if they were involved in missionary care issues, there would be so much less attrition on the field. 
People wouldn't be coming home for this and that and the other. I don't care what they tell you in writing or in person is the reason they left the field. But in most cases, it's preventable where there's missionary care involved. Mission strategy. This is like a foreign term to most of our missions teams and our, and our church leaders. Mission strategy. What do you mean by that? Well, how about let's, let's work on and let's define a mission strategy that's really fitting to our church. I'll give you some examples later. But a mission strategy that really makes sense that our people can wrap their hands around and understand how we got there and what we're doing there. I remember going in so many churches and they have a big map on the board, right? Somewhere near the lobby or in the hallway. And they got a big map on the board and they got pens in the map. And they've got yarn with dust on it that goes out to a picture. It's been there a long time. And, and you ask people, who is this? I don't know. What do they do? I don't know. What, what about this one? I don't know. What? You mean you don't know who your missionaries are? You don't know? Do, what kind of strategy is that? Well, it's like take a shotgun and aim it at the map and go boom. And wherever there's, you know... A pellet, that's where you put a missionary. No. We want more rifle scope, fire at a specific target and hit it and do it and be involved in it so that you own it and get the fruit from it. Missionary training is almost non-existent in the local church, but I say this, I said it in the first session, if you train up elders, you have a really good start in training up missionaries. If you know how to train elders and do that, then start there because... Basically, missionaries should be elder or deacon, depending on their ministry, qualified. At least the character is the same, right? So you know how to do parts of that. There's some parts you don't need, you don't know necessarily, and you might need help on. Fine, but start there. Just because somebody approaches the pastor and says, I think, sorry, I think God is calling me to the mission field doesn't mean that the pastor capitulates and gives him the keys to the treasury. No way. No. They need to be qualified in the same way. They need to be tested and verified so that you know that they have the character and the qualities it's going to take to stay on that field long term because that's what it's going to take. The easy mission fields are already taken. The hard ones are yet to come. So we're talking about whereas in the past, in a nearby language, a missionary goes to the field, they can learn one language, and everybody in the country speaks it. And it doesn't take very many presentations of the gospel to start bearing fruit. You go to some of the harder countries, and it takes not just four presentations of the gospel, maybe 40 presentations of the gospel for someone to really begin to understand it. And so our kids in one part of the world, not only are they in a diglot situation where they have to learn two new languages, so they know English, that doesn't count for anything, but they have to know the trade language, they have to know the standard language, they have to know the dialect language, they have to know the next dialect language that they're really aiming to. And because they didn't even start in that country, they've already learned another dialect of that before. So they're working on the sixth language now. But that's the kind of commitment and stamina it takes to reach the last unreached people groups of the world. Missionary training, you up for that? Let's talk about value principles, or I call it guiding principles. Guiding principles. Guiding principles for a church form the boundaries or framework in which the missions ministry of the church operates. So this is where when I go in as Propempo, I go to a church and I say, I pretty much insist, I think there's only been one exception in the last 25 years, I insist that I meet first with the elders of the church or whoever the leading elder decision-making council is. I want to meet with the pastors, elders of the church first before any of the other missions people. Why? Because frankly, if the elders and pastors don't get it and wrap their arms around it and agree to it, then whatever some other group in the church is going to do is going to hit a roadblock over and over and over again. just doesn't work very well. It can't be as effective. But where the elders of the church say, here are the rails to run on. Here's the principles of the framework. If you do these things within this framework, if you stay on the rails, then it's going to go well. We're going to approve it. We have already agreed to these principles. That's what we're going to go with. 
Then you've got something to really work with. And then I start meeting with the missions team and whoever else is involved in it. Guiding principles are actual value statements of the church. What is of utmost importance to the leadership and to the church? It varies slightly from church to church, but I'm going to give you some examples. First, doctrinal alignment. I put this first because everything that we know and believe starts with the Bible. It just does. Doctrinal alignment is so important for the individual missionary and for the team that they're going to and to the agency. And as you walk through that sequence, you may have a little bit less and a little bit less totally agreement with where you're going. But you at least want to have the individual missionary totally on your side. Do they subscribe to your statement of faith? Do they or not? So there's a church in Laurel, Mississippi, had two missionaries. I asked them to do this thing, and they asked their missionaries, are you in doctrinal alignment with our statement of faith? And they had two of the missionaries they support uh, in different places of the world. One said, uh, no, we're not in alignment. And the other one said, we've never been asked this before. We don't know what to say. So the first one, they said, no, we're not in alignment. We said, are you willing to be in alignment? And the missionary said, well, not really. We're kind of fixed on what we're doing and how we're doing it and what we believe. We don't believe like you guys. And the church said, bless your heart. They're from Laurel, Mississippi. That's what they say. That means pity you, man, because we are going to graciously, generously cut off your support over the course of the next 12 months. Slowly, we're going to taper it right off. And you'll have a chance to make up that support somewhere else. We're not going to support you any longer because you don't really represent our church doctrinally. The other guys, they said, what do we do? And the pastor said, hey, guess what? This is a teaching opportunity. He started sending them books. He visited them on the field. They became doctrinally like-minded. They had never been held to account on that before by their mission agency or their church. But they became actually really good dudes where they were serving. Because they grew in their doctrinal understanding. Another church, Anchorage, Alaska, with a member sent missionary that turned to radical charismatic. Now this was from a well-established family in the church. It was a political powder keg. What do we do with this guy? He's like, not like us at all. And he doesn't want to change. Let's bring him home and talk to him. That didn't really work out very well. Over time, they had the guts to stick it out and make the transition so that that guy didn't represent their church anymore. Now, it took some doing, but they were able to accomplish it, and it worked out better for all concerned. If the missionary is an extension of the local church, they must represent what the church would do and be in their situation. That's what you would want. I mean, if you sent an elder, um, I'm not suggesting anyone in particular, like just sent an elder right now, like tomorrow, give them a plane ticket, go to some unreached people group, and stay there for a couple of years, what would you expect them to do? Now, Besides, like, dying a hundred deaths and all the transition stuff that they go through, but trying to learn the language and, what, you know, how, what would shape their decision-making? And hopefully, the doctrinal thing would be a big factor. So that's a big deal. Number one is doctrinal alignment. Number two is local church connected and focused. And if you understand anything about me, I'm a local church guy all the way. So what I mean by that is no matter what ministry they're doing, is there a conscious connection that connects them to growing and developing local churches? Are they doing that, or are they just kind of multiplying a campground ministry, or a youth ministry, or a music ministry, or whatever they're doing? We have a, a young couple that's related to our church. The gal grew up in our church. She wants to be a missionary pilot. And I'm like, that's wonderful, awesome. You're using your skill. You've got great aptitude. It's fantastic. She marries a guy that's going to be a missionary pilot mechanic. Oh, that worked out really well. Um, so you two are going somewhere. Just make sure that the church is involved in that discuss discussion and decision. Like, you are not a free agent to go wherever you think and then ask the church for support. It doesn't work that way. You're not a free agent. The church is walking with you and helping you make that decision because we want to see you in a place where you're making a difference in the planting of churches. And we want that reflected in your newsletter. Yeah, you flew X number of air hours. Yeah, you repaired the engine. Yeah, you did the overhaul. Yeah, you did this and that in hard weather. Okay, cool. That's fine. Good for you. How is that planting churches? How is that developing church leadership? Make that connection. You were serving somebody that was doing that. 
You are making it possible for somebody to do that that it would be impossible otherwise. That's the stories we want to hear. There was a church I was helping in Houston, Texas, and I had them map this stuff out. And they discovered, to their chagrin, that a third of all of the substantial funds from this pretty wealthy church was going to campus ministry. They didn't even realize it. Pretty much everybody in campus ministry in the four major campuses in Houston, Texas, all knew that if they asked this church for support, they were going to get something. And I'm like, what? Number one, support me. No. But, uh, I mean, that thought went through my head. I never actually said that. But no, that's like way too easy. You didn't ask any questions here. Are the students that are becoming believers in their ministry being guided to join healthy churches? It doesn't even have to be this one. But are they being consciously guided to be a part of a healthy church? And is the staff member attending and active in membership in a healthy church themselves? Let me tell you, in general, campus ministries avoid that like the plague. And that just is not right. Biblically, that's just not right. They need to be guiding consciously, intentionally, the fruit of their ministry to healthy churches, growing healthy churches, establishing, developing healthy churches. And that doesn't mean the campus church. All right? Just disqualify that right out. Does the campus church baptize? No. Do they train up and, and uh, take in elders? No. Do they accept anybody who comes to the church as a member? Uh, no. Do they even have membership? Uh, no. Guess what? They're not a church. Might as well have Pastor Pillow give the sermon. So whatever the field ministries, and I've worked with these as illustrations, well drilling in Guatemala, ministry, ministry, medical ministry in Thailand, youth sports outreach in France and Switzerland, these ministries are doing things that are non-traditional mission stuff, partly just to get entree into the country at all. But they are very consciously connecting what they're doing to local churches, either strengthening, helping, helping or planting local churches. That's what we want to see happen. When you see that happen, then you know, okay, this is something that we could actually support. It makes sense, biblically and practically. The missions team is aimed at enabling involvement. So I mentioned this as a paradigm shift for most churches. Most missions committees or missions teams were established to kind of get the administrative headache off of the leadership or the congregation, and they have more or less independent authority or decision-making to guide the budget or whatever in whatever ways they want. And they have their own internal mechanism that's a great black box mystery to everybody else, and even some of them, and then they just do what they do on behalf of the church. But I say the missions team uh, actual purpose is not in doing it on behalf of the church, but involving the whole church, getting everybody active in missions, getting everybody missions minded, everybody have a touch with a missionary, an understanding of what their role is personally in missions. So mobilize through inspiration, information, opportunities, and shift responsibility to the congregation. We have this cool thing in our church it's uh, with small groups, we call them K groups for short. It's koinonia groups. So there's small groups that meet regularly right now um, as we speak. Um, they're, they're gearing up for the next Sunday's meeting. And um, every mission, every K group has a mission advocate. They have a designated person that intentionally every week brings up the name of the one missionary that that group has adopted so that they can pray for them. Now, there's other responsibilities as well. When it's Christmas, birthdays, anniversary, the group does special things for them. At least special cards or emails or whatever, um, appropriate to the security level in the country, right? So whatever they're doing. But in addition, whenever that missionary comes home for a visit or for medical or for a home assignment or furlough, whatever you want to call it, whenever they come home, that small group is totally responsible for them. They pick them up at the airport. They make sure, depending on their length of stay, they have a car, they have a phone, they have internet capability, they have references for doctors, mechanics, whatever, they, housing. They, they stuff the pantry so they open the doors of the refrigerator and the cupboards and they see food there already. 
They don't have to be traumatized for the visit to Vons or Kroger or whatever. But that's, that's shifting the responsibility. It's funny because our missions team might not even know that the missionary was visiting because the missionary connects directly with the K group and tells them, and the missions team goes, oh, they're in town? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, we're totally taking care of it. Cool. Relational priorities. Support flows through relationship. We say there must be a binding connection to the church other than finances. Because I'm the missions pastor and our church is known for, you know, mission support and giving and training and all that kind of stuff, we have missionaries that contact us out of the blue. So I had this missionary with a well-known mission, I won't mention, who said, uh, would you support us? And he sent me his missionary sort of um, portfolio thing by email. It was a big PDF file. And I'm flipping through this thing. I said, man, that is the best missionary introduction I have ever seen. So I call him back and I said, hey, man, can I use that as an example for other missionaries? He said, yeah. I said, we're not going to support you. (laughs) Because you're from Michigan. And that's a long way away from Atlanta. We think you should raise your support in Michigan and not have to come to Atlanta the way we want you to come and spend weeks with us every time you have a home assignment because of relationship. We want our people to, like, you know, press the flesh, to to get to know you, to put arms around you and know you very personally. And if you're in Michigan and we're in Atlanta, you know, that's that's not going to work very well. At at minimum, it's going to be a bigger cost. In fact, we had a church like that ourselves. Early in our ministry, there was a, a church where we took linguistics school in uh, Dallas, Texas area, and the chapel where we went started supporting us. We said, ah, oh, that's great. These are praying people. It's a small church. We love them. They're giving their little bit. We come home for our first official furlough about five years later, and they said, hey, we want you to come visit our church. And I said, no. They said, what? We've been supporting you. I said, yeah, if we visit your church, it's going to cost us the support you gave for the last five years to get there and back. I I don't think it's a good stewardship thing. And they said, fooey, we'll pay for that too. So we went. We had a great time. But I I was not going to just go that far from Atlanta over to Dallas just for a weekend sort of, hey, how do you do, and hug each other and all that. It's like, if you want to support us, great. But... We're going to be careful about stewardship. Um, So there must be some kind of binding connection to the church other than finances by itself. Too many missionaries are supported simply because they are a fop. You know what a fop is? Friend of the pastor. Then what happens when the pastor moves to another church or something happens to that church? And where's the relationship there? Now, I get it. I'm speaking practically on the campus of a seminary. And this happens all the time. Fellow seminarians, you know, they want to go to the mission field. Who do they contact first? Their fellow seminarians. They go through the TMS grad list, and they find other seminarians. Hey, I'm a TMS guy. That is not an automatic pass in my book. Oh, it's a great check mark. Absolutely. That's cool. But it's not an automatic. They need to be supported for reasons other than being Aunt Sally's nephew which is about like a fop. (laughs) Emphasis on personal engagement or involvement. So this is a guiding principle, man. This is a value. We want to be involved with our missionaries. Is it possible for us to do that? Is, is it feasible for us to want to do it? What, what about if they're in an unreached people group that's really hard to get into a high-security country? How can we do that? How can we serve them? So you might have to be creative. Like, you can't send a literature distribution team to Arab Muslim countries. You just don't do that unless you enjoy da- jail time. You, you just can't do that. You've got to ask the question, in what ways will our congregation be able to engage with and develop ownership in the ministry? We want every single person in the pew to know their name well enough to at least recognize them as being on the missionary board, if you have that, but also understand something about how we might be able to help them. We had some dear friends in East Asia. East Asia. The same country where the coronavirus started. Got it? Okay. 
they, they came to a point where their five kids really needed schooling and they weren't sure what to do because the options available to them were really not very good. Our church happens to be like world experts in homeschooling. And they were our missionaries. We said, we'll take care of that. So we helped with their, you know, counsel in the discussion, select curriculum and follow-up and all that stuff. Their kids are ridiculously smart. They speak a really, really difficult language, English, and that other language. They, they're just brilliant kids. We helped them. We basically supplied all of the printed parts and media parts of the homeschool curriculum for their five kids. Their oldest is now finishing her PhD. And the youngest is graduated from high school and going on to a great and glorious college career somewhere in a Christian college. But, hey, our church owned that. That was something we could do. That's how we could get involved in developing ownership for that missionary family. It was awesome. Um, North Africa Project Development. I'm not sure how much to say about this, but when we were considering um, what would be our strategic focus, um, we wanted to be able to have personal involvement. And we were working with people in Western Europe who were focused on Arab Muslim immigrants. And we said, that's great. Where do the most of them come from? They come from North Africa. So we basically developed a plan that would kind of stepping stone, leapfrog from relationships there and discipleship and church planting into the possibility of training people to go back to their home countries in North Africa with the gospel. That was the original plan. And we did a 25-year plan because we figured that's how hard and that's how long it takes. I think I show a little bit more about that later, but we, we want ownership. Uh, the, let me go back to that. Um, our senior pastor said, David, we appreciate this and all the elders embrace this. We're going in the right direction. This is the right thing to do. He said, the problem is you're on the freeway doing 70 miles an hour thinking about how all this is going to work out and it's going to be fantastic and hard and a challenge. It's be like climbing a mountain and you're going to reach the summit and wave the flag and say, yay, Jesus, we made it. Everybody else is on the on-ramp. So you need to get people from the on-ramp in their ed education and understanding onto the freeway, at least, with you going in the same direction. That was huge. That was a great... Uh, illustration because really we did have this education thing to go through and over a period of time um, took more than one year we kind of brought people up to here's our rationale behind how God led us in choosing this kind of outreach and here's how we're gonna do it and here's who we're gonna support and how it's gonna work out so it's great they own it very much now it's no big deal for people in our congregation to see someone come to church in a jalaba in a in an Arab robe no problem Number six, guiding principle, it's a value. Fewer get more. Instead of seeing how many pins we put on the map, uh, that's the Montgomery, Alabama illustration. Literally, I was going to help a church, and I talked to the pastor, and he was so proud of this world map in the big lobby. And they had pins all over the place, like I'd never seen so many pins on a map. Pins all over the place. He said, yeah, it's our goal to put a pin in every country on earth, like 220 countries. And some of them absolutely close. So I don't know how they get a pin on some of them. But anyway, I was like, yeah, and how much do you support them for? Well, we start at $25 a month. They were a big church. $25 a month times 200. What is that? It's not very, very much money <laughs> for them. I mean, and, and you add it up. It's, it's just not that much. How can you possibly have ownership in the church where you don't even know people's names? <laughs> They're like just an anonymous pin on the map. Fewer have more substantial ownership and commitment to the person and the ministry because of this financial partnership. So people in your church not only know the missionary's name, they know the names of the primary people they're asking prayer for in the country that they're living in. That's cool. 
So you have people in our congregation that ask me, because I'm supposed to know all this stuff, hey, what about Andrew in, you know, Arab Muslim land? Well, this is the latest I heard on Andrew. They know Andrew is the code name for this guy. And so they, they put it together and they say, okay, we're praying for him in our K group. And then you have sort of the other side of the thing, the Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Calvary Church, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, supports their people 100%. I don't think every church can do that, should do that. They have a couple secrets. They had wealthy people die and give their money to missions. So anybody willing to do that? But um, they support now. To hit the threshold to be supported by Calvary Church Lancaster, you have to have been actively working as a member in that church in variety of ministries for five years. That's part of the threshold. So you're tested as well. You have to be approved in a whole process of approval and pre-field training within the church before you ever apply to a mission board. And that doesn't mean that some of the money might not come from elsewhere, but the church guarantees that you'll have 100% when you finally go. So that's a big difference in ownership. I love our pastor's little saying. He says, we, not all the missionaries we support are sent from our church. He says, we may not be your sending church, but we want to earn the right to be your favorite church. We love on him so much. I've asked the missionaries this because they know I quote this all the time. I said, is that true? Are we your favorite church? He said, oh yeah, hands down. Why? Because we love on him so much. We pray for him so much. We communicate with him so much. We're not their primary financial sending church. We're not the church where they all originated from. Some of them are. But we're their favorite church because we know them. We know them really well. We serve them and shepherd them very well by God's grace. How are we doing? I'm not looking at my watch. What time do we have? I got how many? Two minutes. Whew. Fasten your seatbelts. I'm having too much fun. This is an important one, and um, let me just tell you, you're going to get, when TMAI posts it, you'll get the video of this session, the audio of this session, the PowerPoint of this session, the handout of this session, and this graph will be in there. So briefly, a lot of people find this very helpful. This tier is relationship to the church. You define what tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four means. Tier one means they grew up in the church. Tier two is they're related to the church in their latter, say, adult history. Tier three is maybe somebody who's not as connected. And then you look at ministry priorities. Priority one in my book would be church planting and development. Priority two would be other ancillary ministries that contribute to that. Tier priority three might be Timothy type or technical ministries that support all of that. Priority four would be maybe something else. Then you talk about access to the gospel, and we run into this all the time. People say, my neighbor's lost, my school chum's lost, my workmate's lost. Aren't they unreached? No, they're not unreached because they know you, dude. (laughs) They're unreached because they don't have a chance to get to the gospel. The UUPG is unengaged, unreached people group. Unengaged, unreached people group. That means there's no known resident Christian witness at all in that ethnic group. And then unreached people groups and a new initiative or pioneering, and then Timothy or tech institutional stuff. Goodness, out of time. Having fun, pursuing focus. What is strategic focus? I, I'm going to have to just close um, because I want to respect your time. But thank you so much for coming. There's more, obviously. This is what Propempo does. We help you understand this stuff. We help you get a handle on it. We want your church leaders to take the lead, and we'll come alongside them to understand a little bit of how to do that. Let's close in prayer. Uh, Father, just like in the session, we're just overwhelmed with the volume of stuff that we probably should understand better than we do. We are your under-shepherds under our Lord Jesus Christ, and we ask that you would please help us and glorify yourself in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.